thank you. So if you want to know sort of where I'm going, because you might think that this lecture is uh, a bit like the first uh, verse of the book of Genesis, without form and void. Um, <laughs> There is a handout on some of the chairs that just gives the outline of the direction I'm going to take. So I'll give that to somebody sitting there. Uh, so the subject of the evening is Christian spirituality and mental health. And in order to help me with this, I brought my personal psychiatrist with me, um, Roz, my wife, who's sitting here. So. Um, and she'll be helping with the questions a bit later on. Nathan asked me to speak for an hour and a half. Um, I can't do that, but I can sure as hell make it seem as if I am. <laughs> <laughs> I want at the start then to clarify a confusion that might accidentally arise by the title. When people speak about somebody having mental health issues, they usually do not mean that at all. They mean the person has mental ill health issues. And it's important to get that distinction clear because there still exists a whole lot of misunderstanding and a whole lot of failure of engagement in our society in relation to the proper care and treatment of people with mental illness and of the people who live with them and support them. So what I want to do is um, ask a, the question near the start of why bother at all? Why bother with people with mental illness? It's often they don't produce anything, so why bother? Why bother with old people? Why bother with sick people? Why not get on with the winners in our society? Because if you invest in winners, you have a society that wins. Maybe not. So I want to ask the why bother question, then I want to kind of lay some foundations for what perhaps counts as mental good health, and then reflect on Christian responses and the connections between Christian spirituality and mental ill health. And if I'm still talking when you wake up and you want to go back to sleep, just snuggle down and it will end eventually. <laughs> now, I've got at least four personal reasons for taking a particular interest in this area myself. First, three times in my life I've suffered so seriously from depression that I have needed medical help. The first time in hospital, I know that I'm vulnerable to depression. I call it having an available depression. Second, throughout my ordained ministry, I spent a lot of time working pastorally, one-to-one -one, with clergy and lay people who've been experiencing depression and anxiety and other mental ill health issues. So I know from experience that Christians including Christian ministers, are as vulnerable to the disabling effect of mental illness as anybody else's. Being a Christian does not defend you from this any more than being a Christian defends you from getting cancer or measles or any other illness. Third reason, as I've already said, I'm married to a consultant psychiatrist as one wag once said in reply to that, isn't every husband. <laughs> My wife, Ros, has spent nearly all her medical career working to bring healing to people with mental illness and to help people who support mental illness sufferers. Fourth, I'm convinced that one of the things that churches need to learn to do better is to speak the truth about difficult parts of human experience. Many churches are happy enough to speak in generalizations about the poor or the sick or the vulnerable. But when people in our own church fellowship or our own Christian minister 
our own church leaders suffer from mental ill health, it's easy to shy away from facing up to it, and we can find ourselves contributing to the social stigma that sometimes seems to go with mental illness almost as much as non-Christians sometimes do. Finally, that's finally in this section, as a Christian minister, my experience is that because of its very nature, as a range of invisible crippling illness, that is something to do with the state of our minds, as well as because of the public misunderstanding that often goes with mental illness, it can bring particular challenges and opportunities to Christian believers. So those are personal and pastoral reasons for being interested, but I think there are other types of reasons as well. And the first of these I call reasons of compassion. Mental illness is at least as distressing to the sufferer as physical illness, often more so. It's not often recognised that mental illness is at least as dangerous as the most life-threatening physical illnesses. Mental illness can be fatal to the sufferers and leave a legacy of suffering for friends and family that may never ever be resolved. Experiencing mental ill health yourself, or often as least as difficult, supporting a family member who's suffering from mental illness can leave you feeling odd, isolated, unworthy and powerless. Apart from that, it's a barrel of laughs. <laughs> the Gospels show us Jesus having a special and distinctive compassion for suffering powerless and marginalised people. So, if we're to be authentic in our Christian discipleship, we will find ourselves called to share Jesus' compassion and to express it practically through the kind of people we are and the kind of things that we do. So that's compassion reasons for being interested. And then there are economic reasons. People with mental illness often have to take time off work, as I myself did, or when they are able to continue working, find ourselves struggling to do our job as well as we and our employers would like. Having a large portion of the population from uh, suffering from mental illness is very expensive. Providing treatment for mental illness is expensive too and it can take a long time. I accessed the NHS England website on Friday to see what the cost of providing mental health services through the NHS in Britain is now and it is currently running at £105 billion pounds per year. But this has a personal and family dimension as well. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine 105 million. About £4.50 and I'm for a pint. You know, well, a pint in London, £4.50. It's outrageous. Oh, anyway, there we go. <laughs> I can't imagine 105 billion, but I can imagine this. Becoming mentally ill or having a family member who is can stretch your resources to breaking point and contribute to a deeper financial and cultural poverty. At a time when our government seems increasingly committed to cutting benefits to needy people and to promoting a message that to be needy is to be a burden on society, the economic dimensions of mental ill health and the emotional and psychological results that go with it can add to the further burden of stress that is already being borne. And so there are also justice reasons for being interested. Related to the economic issues are justice issues and therefore political issues. Even with that level of spending, according to the NHS website, um, uh, th there is uh, 
only a proportion of those needing hospital treatment for mental illness in our country are actually able to receive it. The NHS website says about one in four. That's to say people who need to be in hospital, three quarters of them, can't get there. The position for children and young people suffering from mental illness is even worse, such that in large parts of our country, there is no dedicated facility for children and young people suffering from mental ill health at all, and they have to be sent miles away from home to receive safe inpatient treatment. It's been well said that if the treatment facilities for cancer or heart disease in the UK were at such a low level as those for mental illness, there would be protests in the streets. And there are theological issues, reasons for being interested. Christians and members of other religions are not the only ones in the world who have a care for people who suffer. But Christians have a particular reason to be interested. For Christians believe that people are created in the image of God, are created from the love of God, are called to live together in communities of the love of God, and to live with freedom and joy in the world that God loves. This means being committed to the priorities Jesus in the Gospel is committed to. For to be Christian at all is to be a determined follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from that, there aren't any reasons why we should be interested in this. Now, let's come to the experience then that we bring together in this room this evening. Mental illness of one sort or another can come to almost anybody at any time in their lives. It is very widespread in the population with 25%, one in four people needing uh, treatment for mental ill health at some time in our lives. It makes no distinction, as I said, between Christians and non-Christians and it very often has effects far beyond the experiences of the people directly suffering from it. So let's pause for a moment to consider the experience you bring. And I'm not going to ask anybody to speak, but I am going to ask you to raise your hand. Could you please raise your hand when I ask you to, if you yourself, or a member of your family, or a colleague at work, or a friend has experienced depression or other mental ill health that you or they have received treatment for from the GP or from hospital. Raise your hand now if that's true of you. Just look around. I don't think there is a hand in the place that is down. Isn't that stunning? I want to just highlight a number of the challenges, then, that mental ill health brings to Christians. Most of these are common to everybody. Here are just some of them. There are questions about identity. Who am I when my mind is doing things like this to me? I know I am odd and I can't do anything about it. Questions about belonging. Why do I feel so alone? And how can people continue to treat me with such respect and friendship and love when I feel that I must be so hard and unpleasant to be with? Questions about responsibility and powerlessness. Why can't I seem to do anything about the way I feel and sometimes about the way I act? Will I ever be able to be any use to anybody ever again? Questions about coping. When will I be able to get back to work and stop relying on the tablets? When will I start being able to feel good about my family again? Questions about blame. What have I done wrong? 
or what has been done to me that makes it so difficult to control how I feel and to control how I sometimes act? Questions about faith. What has gone wrong with my faith that has caused me to be like this? Questions about healing. Surely if I prayed more, my healing or my loved one's healing would come. Questions about medical treatment and faithfulness. Surely if my faith was stronger, I wouldn't need to take the medication. Questions raised by the long-term or permanent duration of mental illness. If I'm always going to be like this, how can I live? Or is it worth going on living? Questions about God. Why does God let me be like this? Why does God not answer prayers? Questions about the church. Is the church the kind of community that can cope with having somebody like me in it? And then questions about where to get the best available medical treatment and talking therapies if they're recommended. Psychotherapy and counselling can be very hard to access and can be very expensive if you um, are accessing it privately. And anyway, how do you understand the balance of effectiveness between taking tablets and having the talking therapies. And then there are questions about authenticity and truthfulness of our spiritual experience. Charismatic Christians, and by the way, I would count myself as one of them. I was blessed by baptism in the Holy Spirit at St. Mark's Gillingham um, in October of 1968, uh, which was in the previous millennium. Um, Charismatic Christians will often speak about having a word from the Lord or being given a picture by the Lord or being guided by God toward particular people or places or actions. Sometimes these gifts of the Holy Spirit can set people going in new directions that bring change and fruitfulness to their lives in truly nurturing and wonderful ways. But sometimes people who are mentally unwell can receive words or pictures or promptings apparently from God or from beyond themselves that can seem equally positive at first, but that can also arise from distorted perceptions and lead to disturbing and dangerous actions. How are we to know what is an authentic and true gifting and grace from God and what is part of a person's illness? or part of the onset of a person's illness where the illness has not yet been recognised. So those are the kind of questions that are around. So it's not at all complicated, is it? <laughs> now, laying out the issues like this can leave us feeling rather intimidated and de-skilled, feeling that we have nothing to offer no way to respond to all this and that we should phone up the little men in the van with the white coats and ask them to take ourselves away. So it's important now to lay some of the groundwork for hopefulness that can bear godly fruitfulness and build up our faith and confidence in the grace of God and in the graces to be found among the people of God. To lay this groundwork, I want to reflect on some of the questions I've already highlighted. So I'm going to offer reflections about our identity, who we are, our belonging, who we share our lives with, our purpose, what we're for, our responsibility when our purpose is frustrated, and finally, uh, I want to comment on our ministry with people with mental ill health. And together I want to suggest that these reflections have an important contribution to make to understanding some of the connections between mental health, mental ill health and Christian spirituality. 
Now, each one of these could take a long series of lectures to survey properly. So I can just highlight some of the main points, but it should be enough for you to get hold of some of the flavours of what I want to say. At this point, I must ask, are you all right at the moment? Because there's a lot of this stuff coming at you, isn't there? Just kind of hang on in there and, and just let the key things that speak to you uh, bang around in your mind. And um, I'm sure that if you need to have the whole script, um, we can get that to you by email. So don't try and remember all of this stuff all the time. I want to find a groundwork, a foundation for hopefulness, first in who we are, in our identity. The Bible teaches that like the rest of creation, people are one of the good ideas that God had. When you look in the mirror, you're looking at one of God's good ideas. How about that? <laughs> God does not create out of nothing. God creates out of love. And people are here because of the love of God. The expression the Bible uses in Genesis is that God created people in his own image. That means that people are built to have built into them something of the character of God. This means that people are capable of love and desire, of creativity and communication, of rational and imaginative thought, of free will and personally chosen action, of joyfulness and celebration, of fulfillment and of resting and peacefulness. All of those things are built into who we are. Isn't that wonderful? Christianity therefore teaches the essential goodness and worthwhileness of human beings and the capacity for people to be even better than they already are. Christianity does not, underline this, does not teach the utter depravity of humanity. Depravit uh, human, humanity completely and eternally separated from God, utterly depraved. But that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that people are inherently um, uh, good and worthwhile because God created them and it does not teach the utter depravity of humanity. That's important to get hold of because so often people with mental ill health problems feel absolutely worthless. Now all this sounds wonderful and ideal but we also know that because humanity has become distant from God we're easily dragged down by original sin. That original sin is not a biblical expression. Uh, St. Augustine of Hippo cooked it up. Um, but it's a useful one. And a really good definition of original sin is that humanity has an infinite capacity to cock things up. Now this may be true, but God has already thought about that and responded to it. He's responded to it in two ways. First, God has responded to what the mess that we make by, by deciding never to desert us however bad we become and however bad we make things for ourselves and others and however low we sink. There are no no-go areas for God in this world. As people's experience of encountering human kindness and God's love, even in Nazi concentration camps, shows. But second, God has responded to our capacity to experience suffering and evil by being God with us in Jesus Christ. Jesus coming and living and dying all speak the same message. Jesus comes uh, to show us what God thinks of us. Jesus comes to show us what we are worth to God. Absolute love absolute welcome. As I sometimes say, my mother used to say to me, Gordon, I love you, but... Now, I wish you wouldn't X, Y, or Z. Absolute love and absolute welcome are God's default script when it comes to us. That's our identity. 
It's who we really are, whether we're happily living untroubled lives or whether we're struggling with terrible suffering. Two expressions Paul uses in the New Testament can use, be used to sum this up for now. He says that a person who is in Christ is a new creation. All the stuff of the past that drags you down belongs in the past. God has made everything new. Or in Romans 8, Paul says, people who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. We are people who are invited to call God Father in exactly the same way that Jesus did. So the first piece of groundwork of hope that can speak to questions of mental health is getting clear who we are, our identity. In biblical Christian spirituality, you are a person set free, beloved of God in Jesus, called to grow and to be nurtured in that love. That's the first groundwork of hope. The second is the hope of belonging. The Bible is clear that God made people to be together, to support and encourage each other, so that together we can be fruitful. Both of the creation stories in Genesis make this point. The first one I've already referred to, God created humankind in his image, male and female, he created them. The second creation story in Genesis shows that God understands that it's not good for a person to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. This teaches us not just about the foundations of human one-to-one -one relationships. It teaches about the foundations of human community. We are humans in community because that is God's intention for us. So throughout the Bible, God deals with people in community. The Hebrew scripture talks about covenant community the people who are called to live out the reality that you will be my people and I will be your God. In the New Testament, Jesus calls not just one, but a whole community of disciples, and their calling is to bring people together with Jesus so his life will continue to be lived by them. Ecclesia, um, uh, the uh, word that's translated church in the New Testament, I wish they'd translated it differently, because it gives you the impression that Jesus came into the world to found a church. He didn't. He came into the world to save it. And the church is a kind of second reaction in relation to that. Ecclesia, the word for church, means the call together ones. Now, the New Testament is as realistic about this as the Old Testament is. The community of God's people will always include folk who are suffering, who are disoriented, lost, who seem to be living in their own personal versions of hell. But the fact that they're unhappy or suffering or out of joint in some way does not make them any less part of the community. There is such solidarity in this idea that we belong together that St. Paul can say in Romans 12, if one person suffers, all suffer together. If one person rejoices, we all rejoice together. So hope comes from our identity, our belonging. Third, hope comes from our purpose. Because humanity is called into being by the love of God, we have a sense of purpose right from the start. The Bible is full of stories of people being called by God to do things. Matthew, Mark and Luke tell us that the first words Jesus said to the people he called were, follow me. And his last words were, go into the world. And he intended them to follow him together and to go into the world together. Sometimes I think that all the biblical stories about people making great journeys and doing great things for God make me feel a bit of a wuss. And sometimes when I hear testimonies of people, you know, who do some incredible thing, you know, they can't climb Mount Kilimanjaro in the morning, evangelize East Africa in the afternoon, and transform the United States in the evening by the power of the Holy Spirit, I begin to feel, I wonder if I should have got up this morning. The Bible message that people are created with purpose in mind can leave us feeling inadequate, restless, thinking there's something we should be doing, but anxious because we don't know what it is. That is why it is vital for us to understand that God creating us with a sense of purpose 
is not about God creating us to be anxiety-driven activists. There's always stuff to be done, but before we do anything else, there's something else to be done first. And I don't mean prayer, I mean rest. As somebody said, the high point of God's creation story in the Bible is absolutely not the creation of humankind. The high point of the creation story in the book of Genesis is the creation of Sabbath. The great Old Testament teacher Walter Brueggemann says that the Sabbath is the gift of God who is confident enough to rest. One of the loveliest expressions of this sense of purpose that is based on a quiet confidence in God comes from a guy called Saint Irenaeus. His name means the peaceful one. And he said, the glory of God is humanity fully alive. Here then is the third piece of groundwork for hope for mental health. We've spoken about identity, about belonging, and about purpose. Now we come to the fourth piece of groundwork for hope, and that is going to sound a bit stranger, because it is the hope that we find when our responsibilities are frustrated. So yes, we're called to live out of the hopefulness of our identity, belonging and purpose that are all rooted in the love of God. But as they say, or as they say in churches, stuff happens. Elsewhere they express it slightly differently. A whole bunch of things can go wrong that leave our sense of identity blurred to the point of invisibility. We just don't know who we are. It can leave our sense of belonging distorted to the point of non-existence. And our sense of purpose can be misdirected to the point of absolute futility. Our sense of peace becomes a treasured memory or a pipe dream. So how can we talk about our responsibility when everything seems impossible. Well, whatever else the Bible calls us to, it calls us to be truthful and realistic about how things are. That is why it includes stories about people who by the standards of Western society today are clearly suffering from severe mental illness. Such as the first king of Israel, Joshua, who flew into paranoid rages and tried to kill the people around him. Or King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who took to his bed, ate grass, sweated all night, and grew his nails like claws. Or the Gerasim demoniac who was chained up in a cemetery. And there are many others. Now it's true that the Bible sees their illnesses as resulting from rebellion against God or from affliction by demons or both, which is a theology we would normally accept today with very real caution. In any case, Jesus' response when people who are brought to him troubled by demons is to set them free from their afflictions as a sign of the coming of the kingdom of God. That is, as a sign of the restoration of God's purposes in their lives. Probably the most useful place in the Bible then to look for material that speaks of mental distress and illness is in the Psalms. Psalm 22 talks about the dreadful experience of feeling that everybody, even God, has given up on you. Jesus quoted it on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 clearly come out of the experience of terrible depression. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you so disquieted within me? Psalm 116 groans out, the snares of death encompass me, the pangs of hell laid hold on me, I suffered distress and anguish. And in Psalm 102, 
we find the helpfulness that can feature in mental illness combined with the hopefulness that comes from knowing that God is present even in that particular version of hell. My days pass away like smoke, my bones burn like a furnace, my heart is stricken and withered like grass, I'm too wasted to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my skin. I'm like an owl in the wilderness. Woo! Like an owl in the wilderness, like a little owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I'm like a lonely bird on the housetop. And so it goes on. The New Testament says that Mary Magdalene was a person out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons. Now, however we understand that kind of language, it is clear that early on, at least, when Mary Magdalene met Jesus, she was literally in a hell of a mess. And of course, nobody knows what St. Paul meant when he said that for 14 years, he had a thorn in my flesh. Three times have I called on the Lord to take it away, but could it have been some kind of episodic mental illness or blindness or lameness? Nobody knows. Thank God, because if we did know, we would have made it compulsory and there'd probably be a Christian denomination based on it. <laughs> well, examples from the Bible about people's mental suffering could be multiplied. Where on earth is there hope in that? All of the people I've mentioned had an important part to play in the story of God's people, and not all of them got better from their sufferings. So where do I find in that any groundwork for hope, for our understanding of or engagement with mental ill health? I find it in two places. First, when I go back to the Psalms, and second, in something Paul said about his own sufferings that I believe opens the gateway for something new and fruitful to come out of it. So Psalms 42 and 43 that contain that agonized question, why are you cast down on my soul? Why so disquieted within me? Also contain a different kind of expression. So the Psalm said, these things I remember as I pour out my soul how I went with the congregation of the people of God. And there's a repeated chorus in that prayer poem. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him who is my King and my God. Memory and hope expressed as recollection of the presence of God experienced in the past and as the beginnings of confidence in God's faithfulness that will be experienced again. Psalm 116 that speaks so powerfully of the experience of mental, emotional and spiritual desolation also contains the testimony, Gracious is the Lord and righteous, our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. That was the first Bible passage I ever read the day after my conversion. One of the things that distinguishes some forms of mental illness from many kinds of physical illness is that when you experience it, mental illness has no sense of direction. If you're physically ill, you can expect to get better or to come to the end of your life or to be helped to live as well as possible with what cannot be changed. Mental illness is not like that most of the time. Some of it's true for people with mental illness, but in the time of experiencing it, the situation can seem literally hopeless. A kind of living with a dreadful, unending, exhausting, horrible now. This is one of the distortions that mental ill health produces in people's experience, and it contributes to the mythology in our culture that can make things a whole lot worse. A mythology that says that once you've got a mental illness, you will always have it. That mentally ill people are violent and dangerous, 
Whereas the truth of the matter is that many people who experience mental illness do get better. Most of those who experience mental illness that is not resolved do, with good medication and support, live with good quality of life and relationships and achievements. That is why the realism that we find about the present, the revaluing and the drawing of strength from good memory of the past, and the beginnings of confidence in a good future that we find in the Psalms is so important for us as we try to make connections between the experience of mental ill health and the faith we share and profess as Christians. We're going to keep going for another seven minutes. <laughs> okay, we're nearly there, folks. Hang on in there. Now, we don't know much about Ma Mary Magdalene, part, as I said, that she was in a mess when she came into the company of Jesus and his disciples. But there's one thing we know for sure. It was not the mentally stable and dependable John the Apostle. It was not the beloved disciple that John's Gospel speaks about. It wasn't even his own mother that Jesus chose to be the first person he would meet when he rose from the dead. It was Mary Magdalene. When the risen Lord met her, he spoke her name and he gave her something to do. There you are. Two gifts of the risen Lord to her the restoration of her identity and the gift of purpose. Finally, in these examples, uh, we need to hear again Paul's testimony that when he cried out to God to take his suffering away, God had something to say to Paul that was profoundly bad news for him. God had something to say to Paul that was bad news. Lord, take it away. The Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. I can just imagine Paul muttering under his breath, gee, thanks, Lord. Yeah, 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 I'm gr great, great. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of vulnerability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, these examples from the Psalms, from Mary Magdalene, from Paul, speak to me about the groundwork of hope in making some connections between mental illness and Christian spirituality. For all of them testify to the presence of God who does not abandon people with mental illness or any other illness, but remains close by to bring the encouragement of a new day dawning with a restoration of identity and belonging and purpose. When our sense of personal agency and responsibility is undermined by the experience of mental illness, Hope gets born afresh when we become conscious of God's continuing closeness of his love and graciousness. And this presents a challenge, doesn't it? Because when we're in the middle of experiencing mental ill health, certainly in my experience of it, often we just don't have that sense of perspective. We don't have the energy to reach out. We can hear the words, we can even believe they're true, but at the time when they're spoken, the words haven't got the power to make the difference that is needed to make me uh, have a sense of love and joy and strength again. That is why the close presence of God and the realities of God's loving care that speak to who we are, where we belong, what we're for, and that bring grace to the message of our frustrated responsibilities. That is why all this must be embodied it must be embodied. They must be embodied in faithful, loving, positive, undemanding presence. People with mental ill health do often do value words of kindness and encouragement being spoken, but most of all they value and respond to people who are content to be faithfully and undemandingly present with them. The right time for words may come, and when it does, God will give you the right words to say. But first comes simply practicing the presence of God with the suffering person, for it is the loving presence of the living God which is the most comforting and hopeful and healing gift of all. Many of you will know about the teachings of Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, the guy who came up with the idea of practicing the presence of God. Most Christians think of that as something that you do in your personal prayers. But actually, one of the things that you can do 
with people who are suffering from mental ill health or people who are otherwise ill and absolutely exhausted is practice the presence of God by just being with them. Being God with them. So what about our ministry with people with mental ill health? The key word here is with. It's important to watch our language. When we talk about people with mental ill health, we're not just talking about uh, they and them. We're talking about we and us. And the reasons for this are theological and practical. Genuinely Christian spirituality is a spirituality of love, not of power, that listens before it speaks. It's content to wait before it acts. It's committed to learn and serve before it's committed to teaching or imposing its ideas and practices. So genuinely Christian spirituality will be committed to friendship, fellowship and ministry with people with mental ill health. And it will take pains to avoid ministry to scripts. We'll grow best as Christian community in relation to mental ill health when we genuinely embrace the principles of inclusion and fellowship. This brilliant book is called Face to Face, written by Professor Francis Young. Uh, you will all know Professor Francis Young is the world's leading expert on the Chalcedonian definition of the fifth century. <laughs> Much more importantly, Francis Young is the mother of Arthur, who was born with cerebral palsy. She says, uh, she's written another book following this called Arthur's Call. Arthur is now 52 years old. And she says that she has learned all the most important things in her theological understanding from him. She has discovered her, her son to be her most important teacher. And here's a poem that she uh, wrote about the cross when she looked at Arthur's twisted body. Crooked with knots, the fallen timber lies exposed to the elements, draped in decaying moss. Its twisted shape begins to resemble a cross. Unseen, the artist takes the stuff of size and fashioning the faulted timber tries creation out of uselessness. By loss comes compensation. Tragedies emboss the tortured tree of knowledge where death dies. Healed by his wounds, we find in paradox our holiness. Taboos taboo no more. Purity's prison bars pure love unlocks. Incurable, the sickness finds a cure. The crooked timber of humanity has found in crookedness its sanity. I'd like, I'd like to develop the theme of the ministry of people with mental illness more, but I haven't got the time just now because you're beginning to wilt, um, as I would be if I was sitting where you are. But there are, there are two brilliant books, and look, they're only that thick, right? They don't have pictures in, but even you can read this stuff, right? Um, encountering Depression, Frequently Asked, frequently asked Questions, Answered for Christians. That's written by Andrew and Elizabeth Proctor. Andrew is the vicar of Shibbon near um, Borough Green, and his wife Elizabeth is a consultant psychiatrist. And it's very readable, very practical. And this one, which is even smaller, is called Mental Health, the Inclusive Church Resource. I've got the references to these on your handout. Um, and this is one of the very best books that Ros and I have come across uh, about this issue. So there you are. So I'm going to um, crack on. Are you all right for another couple of minutes? I'm glad you are. Um, now, that can be a patronizing way of saying that suffering people are wonderful in spite of their affliction, but that's not what this is about. It's about embracing the reality that our relationships are deeper 
And our capacity for living out of the love of God in Christ is richer when we're energized by the Holy Spirit to recognize in people suffering from men mental ill health or disabilities as brothers and sisters who also may be our pastors and teachers. So I've said enough to indicate the directions that Christian spirituality will call us to travel in as we journey together with people with mental ill health. So I'm just going to list and briefly comment on some of the key features of what I call practical Christian spirituality. What I have to say now will echo what I've been saying throughout this lecture, so this will add as, act as a summing up um, of where we've got to. First, Christian spirituality will be practical. If our spirituality is not practical, it is not Christian. Get hold of that, folks. Spirituality is not about floating off into some ethereal place with God and the angels. It's about being practical. Loving God, loving your neighbour and loving your enemies are practical things. When, Jesus asked, when somebody asked Jesus, who's my neighbour, he told him a story about somebody who needed help. When Jesus taught about the last judgment, he told a story about people feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and visiting people in prison. I don't need to labour that point. So that's the first feature of Christian spirituality, is it's practical. Second, Christian spirituality calls people by its proper names. In the last but one chapter of the inclusive church book I mentioned a minute ago, the title is Giving People Back Their Names. A person's name is who they are. A person with an illness is not just their illness, they are a whole person. They're not properly named when we say he is bipolar, she is schizophrenic, she is anorexic, he is depressive. We do not say he is cancer, she is leprosy, he is mumps. We enable a person to be who they really are when we give them their proper name and their proper character. I saw a newspaper headline in the Lord Forgive Me, the Daily Telegraph, uh, the other day, and the headline read, Cancer, I have cancer, it does not have me. It is significant, I think, that the risen Jesus addresses the most disturbed and disheartened of his disciples by giving them their proper names. Mary, Simon. Third, Christian spirituality is communal. It's about fellowship and belonging. I've already said enough about this. A lot has been written about what makes for a healthy church. Most of it is written about what the church does and how it is organised. But a really healthy church, I believe, is defined by who is in it and how they are included in its ministry. I had the great privilege many years ago of being a pastoral assistant at St Mark's Church, Gillingham. And at that time, and I think it's still true at St Mark's, it's a wonderful church, um, there are quite a large proportion of the congregation there have got very significant either mental illness uh, histories or, or learning difficulties of one sort or another. And I think that's a mark of a healthy church that there is a place there, uh, there for them. Fourth, Christian spirituality is personal. People who are ill need not just a kind of generalised positive regard. You know the kind of thing you get in Anglican churches, not these here. Um, a kind of weak smile of welcome from a distance at the church door. <laughs> what the hell is that? No, never mind. Um, we need people who will take the trouble to get to know us and to be with us and to stick with us when we don't especially feel that we want to be stuck with. Faithfulness is a key character of Christian spirituality. Fifth, Christian spirituality is expressed in public worship that's radically inclusive and non-invasive. In the words of Robin Greenwood, in worship that cares for us. And there's a special role here for sacraments. Sacraments can be very important for people with mental ill health. The point about a sacrament is, uh, like Holy Communion, is you don't have to explain it. It is just there. 
the liturgy speaks for itself without us interfering with it too much. If a depressed person has enough strength to be present at all, that's enough. And that enough is deeply nurturing. And the sacramental ministry of anointing and laying on of hands um, should be a routine part of every church every Sunday. It shouldn't be hived off into special services. Six, spirit, Christian spirituality will give proper value and support to the discoveries and practice of medical model and other therapeutic health for suffering people. This means we'll see medicine and the talking therapies as resources given by God for the blessing of people. And we will support and encourage and pray for people who work with folk with mental illness. And we'll refuse to drive a wedge between spiritual care, practical care and medical care. You can get some extremely dangerous Christian ministry uh, if it's telling people to stop taking the tablets, for example. Finally, almost, uh, Christian spirituality will be content to live trustingly with mystery. Our whole heart's longing for people with mental ill health or disability is that they will get completely well. But the fact is that very many do not get fully and permanently cured, and we don't yet know why. Our conviction is that God does love, does care, and does want people to be whole. But often prayer seems to remain unanswered, or at least God has a different way of responding to the one we would prefer. As the example I used earlier of Frances Young and her son Arthur shows. This living trustfully with mystery is something that is desperately hard to keep on doing when you're on your own or you feel that you are. I had a colleague, a cleric, a, a clergyman, whose daughter was diagnosed with schizophrenia when she was 20. For over 35 years now, she's been in and out of hospital, sometimes having months of being fairly well and then long periods of terrible illness. They're a Christian family and they've prayed and prayed and prayed every which way they know how. Early on, the parents were driven to such despair, they even considered murder and suicide. So alone did they feel. Being part of a Christian fellowship that was and is prepared to be faithful and caring and giving long-term practical help and who could do some of the praying and living with mystery with them and at times for them has made all the difference to that family. In company with their friends they found that they can continue to live with the mystery and discover the comforting and strengthening presence of God with them and with their daughter. Finally, finally, in this time I'm saying it honestly folks, Christian spirituality will be committed to holding people in prayer in sustained ways for long periods of time. I've placed prayer last in this list, not because it's least important, but because it's most important, because too often people think that how and when you pray is what we really mean when we use the expression Christian spirituality. It's part of it, but not all of it. Sure, we will connect Christian spirituality with mental health and mental ill health, by growing more faithful and more practical in our praying. For the purpose of all of this is that together we will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Thank you very much.